You know those Windows shortcuts you use to open your browser, launch your favorite game like Call of Duty? Those can actually be hijacked, and once they're taken over, they can actually be used to grab your password without clicking a thing. Today, we're showing you how that works, why it is effective, and how hackers can turn something like that into a malicious tool. But before we do that, I gotta give a big thank you to our sponsor, Threat Locker, for partnering with us on this series. This is the final episode for now, but if you wanna see more PowerShell content with me and Jacoby, comment PowerShell down below, and we might just bring it back. Now, when Jacoby and I were doing the past episode, we talked about obfuscating the code, but the method we were using kind of assumed that we already had access to the machine. Maybe we with like a USB drop or something sneaky. So Jacoby, what's a more realistic approach for someone that could use this in a real pen test or actually has an adversary going to use something like this to pull it off? Yeah, so in the last video, I showed off a POC that would be more accurately used on something like a pen test where you have physical access to the system. But if we're looking for a more practical approach for getting malware on a target system when you don't have that kind of access, you're gonna wanna try to trick them into downloading a file. That's kind of the beginning of how all malware works. In this instance, we are gonna be taking advantage of the link file again with some slight differences. Now a link file is essentially a shortcut that points to another file on your system that's deeper in uh, the directories. A lot of times people have you know the shortcuts for different games that they play Google, Chrome, whatever else on your desktop. Now the cool thing about link files is they don't show an extension. So if you're looking at these files right here, you can see that this is a PS1 file, this is you know, an image, this is a PNG, etc. So with shortcuts, it's really easy to spoof them to make them look like another file like we've done in this instance. Yeah, sure, what does that file do? What is that? It's a, it looks like it's an image. It was a shortcut of an image. What does it do? Correct, correct. So this is actually a shortcut where I took the icon file right here that I made from this PNG and I set it as that icon, but let's go ahead and get a netcat listener going. Now this shortcut file, essentially what I'm gonna have it do is I'm having it both point to this original file right here, but also run some of my own code in the background, which is the same reverse shell that we showed in the last video. This would just be a more practical approach for getting the malware onto your target's computer whether you send it to them in an email or whatever else. So if we go ahead and double click this, you'll see what it's gonna do is it's gonna both open the image and show that we have a connection back here. So I can do something like, who am I? And it'll show the computer and then, you know, the normal pop calc to show that it's working. So what we're gonna do is go ahead and break that connection for now and we'll close this. This is both similar and very different to the last video. So in the last video, we relied on getting this huge chunk of code, which is the obfuscated reverse shell, and we put it into the metadata of the file itself, and then we used the shortcut to grab that metadata code and then run it. The issue with that is whenever you're sending something over an email or you're having it downloaded from the internet, whatever it is, it strips that metadata. So while again, that would be okay for some sort of pen test scenario where you're actually putting the file physically on their system yourself, it, it won't work the same in a real world scenario with a target that's across the web, for example. So like I said, we have this shortcut right here. It's pointing to both this image and then it's also running some of my code in the background. Now the question is, is how did you make it so you don't have to use this code then, or how did you fit this code in there? When this properties section of a shortcut link right here, which is where the code goes, you can actually only fit 259 characters. So in this instance, I decided to do something different, and that's what you see right here with this uh, notepad file, I'm doing an API call. Now there's different ways that you can do this. I'm, I'm doing an API call out to you know my API that generates the polymorphic reverse shell code on the fly. So if we do this API call, you can see that it generates the shell just kind of like I showed off in the last video. It simplifies it down instead of having to run the whole block of code. Also with this, that what I'm understanding from this is like, if you have it on like a shortcut that they use all the time, let's say it's a game they play every day, you're keeping also persistence too, right? So you're getting a shell every time they launch that. So if I, if you know someone plays, I play Call of Duty on my PC a lot. If you know that I play Call of Duty on my PC a lot, you just put this in the metadata of it. It launches Call of Duty, but in the back end of it also gives you access to my box, right? Yes, that is accurate. 
So in a real world scenario, that's exactly what I would try to do. Like if I had initial access or assuming, well, assuming that you downloaded it, if I knew who you were and I did a little bit of recon before and I knew something, for example, I do know that you play Call of Duty. So if you were someone that I was trying to target, that's something that I might consider is making the shortcut near the Call of Duty shortcut. That way when you downloaded it, it would look familiar and it's something that you would click on. Or you can replace it too. Like if you have a shell on there, you can get complicated and replace a shortcut deep down in your process, right? Yes, that's that's correct. That's correct. And then another thing is is if you get it in the startup folder, it'll it'll basically run it every single time that the computer starts as well. Wouldn't an EDR pick up a startup folder though? Or is there is other locations you can put that the antivirus doesn't get it? So it, it depends, it depends. Some EDRs will pick it up depending on what settings you have. Defender typically doesn't. In the last video, we also talked about uh, the Defender, the exclusion paths and the function I have that can find them. But you can also define an exclusion path without being admin. So you could make the startup folder an exclusion path and then, for example, Windows Defender itself won't look at that folder. So you can put whatever you want in there and it'll run without instant, uh, with, you know, without any problems. So the threat model is different, right? Obviously, my PC is not as locked down as you know, a corporate laptop or a corporate computer that someone uses, a developer uses, or I don't know, a, a CFO uses, right? How do you get this piece of code on there with all this traffic being monitored or you know, not making your API publicly facing, leaking an API key, how do you get that onto this machine with a trusted resource? Yeah, so absolutely. Uh, w one slight disadvantage of the current method of how it's being done is that you would have to pass in your API into that file and make it publicly available to your target, which might not be something that you wanna do. Now, one way that I found to kind of get around that and proxy off my API and doing it with a trusted resource even is by using Cloudflare workers. So there's two things to this though, right? Like one is if your URL gets leaked, they can track you, right? Like tracking it becomes a lot easier. Threat hunters are going to be all over it, right? And you're going to probably get into some uh, URL scan side and things like that. And then two, you said Cloudflare, which is kind of crazy because I feel like a lot of people rely on Cloudflare for their traffic. And it is one that I don't think I thought about ever being malicious, right? Because you can just spin up any Cloudflare instance for free. And most people just think it's their website talking to something or their local environment talking to something they trust, right? Yeah, so essentially uh, that, that that's correct. Having the public facing API is, is not great. So again, I, what I've done is I've set up a Cloudflare worker. Now, if you don't know what a Cloudflare worker is, essentially it's serverless JavaScript code. So it's a JavaScript snippet that I can host on the Cloudflare infrastructure to do basically anything that you want with JavaScript. So in this instance, I've set up a worker that does the actual API call for me. So the Cloudflare worker itself makes a call out to my API with the parameters that I pass it, which you'll see right here in Notepad. This is actually it right here. Now we can actually go to that URL and you could see that this is the Cloudflare worker. You pass in an IP, the port, and then a key. Right? I set this up to mirror it exactly, but in a more practical scenario, you don't actually need to make it so you pass in the key, you could hard code the key that you don't even have to use that on the target system either. So it's kind of like a reverse proxy between the two, right? Between your API and the machine pretty much, right? That's exactly right. It's a reverse proxy, but it's not just another random domain. It's the actual Cloudflare CDN. Whenever people look at this, now I, I made it look a little bit more obvious because it's using Rev for reverse shell and then unit 259, my company, but you can make these subdomains whatever you want. So I could change this to Cloudflare and then I could have this be something like support.cloudflare.workers.dev. Yeah, or like cdn.nahomsec, so it would be me pretty much thinking it's my CDN. For example. 100%, that is that's exactly. That's really clever. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. So in this instance, I'm not, at, in the shortcut itself, in that target file, I'm not actually having it use my API call. What I'm doing personally is I have my Cloudflare worker doing the API call for me, and then I'm using that URL to kind of hide the traffic. So in this instance, in bug bounty terms, essentially, we have obfuscation on both client and server side. We have the code that's obfuscated, and then we also have the, the API call itself being obfuscated, in a sense, being obfuscated 
the traffic itself by using the Cloudflare. What you're doing this is you're pretty much you're blending in your traffic with something that they trust. Their code is obfuscated. People aren't going to be able to easily know where it's going. And then two, the URL looks like it's some random innocent URL. Maybe it's a CDN, but it's not really CDN, right? It's something that you Correct. created. And if, if you were to do like a resolve DNS or an NS lookup on this URL, it's going to come back as a Cloudflare asset. So it's uh, more inconspicuous and, uh, you know, less likely to be looked into deeply. So I know you said most EDRs will probably not pick this up, but surely like there's got to be a way to stop this, right? Yeah, absolutely. So if you're looking at the screen, I'm actually on another box right now that has the Threat Locker agent on it. And so Threat Locker, what they do is they use a concept called ring fencing to stop the WebSocket connection before it's even able to go out. Over here, Instead of having the image, I do have just a straight shortcut to the command prompt. So if this were to work in a perfect world, when we click on this, what it would do is it would open command prompt and then it would do the reverse shell connection in the background, which hopefully we should see a connection pop up right here on the, the listening box in the top right corner. I'm gonna go ahead and double click it now. We get the notification on the bottom that it's been blocked. Now the command prop window did open as expected, but if we look at the reverse shell connection that was supposed to run in the background, it shows that the underlying connection was closed and it was stopped before the call was even able to go out. So the ring fencing is looking at command prompt good, but also like a reverse shell obviously it's not good when it's going out, right? Correct. So in this instance, you could see that ThreatLocker themselves, they were able to differentiate between just the basic CMD call to open the window and then the PowerShell one, which was trying to use WebSockets in a way that they decided wasn't okay on this system and just stopping it before the call was even able to go out. All right, walk me through the whole process. We've got our link hijacked. We've got a reverse shell. Obviously doing calc.ex is a good POC, but what's next? I know in a lot of, you know, when you see pen testing people, they talk about grabbing NTLM hashes. What does that look like? What do you do? I'm actually gonna show you a technique that I just learned about on Twitter recently from somebody that I follow and it's pretty brilliant. It turns out there have been different versions of it floating around for a little bit now, but I do appreciate the guy who introduced me to the concept. What he ended up doing is he reverse engineered the link file on a level that like I haven't actually seen before. We were just showing the last exploit how we can change the the icon of it, right? Now he went deep into the link file structure itself. What he what he learned is that you can point the icon URL to an SMB share URL. What it'll do is it'll attempt a connection and it actually leaks the NTLM hashes between the two systems. Now the POC that he showed off, one of the things that was so brilliant about it, you didn't actually have to click it. So this is this is a, a file that could be used, uh, dropped on a USB or introduced to the system in another way. But the thing that was really, really cool about it is if some people are skeptical, they might not like double click to try to open up something like this. Instead, what they might try to do is right click on it. And so I'm gonna show you it working real quick using the method that he did. So first thing I need to do is go ahead and start responder, enter my password. All right, so you see a responder running. One of the coolest things about this POC that I loved as soon as I saw it is that again, sometimes people are suspicious, so they don't really wanna double click on files that they don't recognize. So something that they might do instead is right click that file to like maybe look at the properties, for example. And that's where this was so cool because it turns out with his version of this POC, the only thing it takes to grab those hashes is to simply right click that file. You don't even actually have to run anything. All you have to do is right click and you can see here on the left that the hashes have been grabbed and this is that internal IP, this is the user, and this is the hashed password of that user. So now all you really have to do is take this hashed password and use something like Hashcat or John the Ripper, and you could go through and crack their password. And now you have access to that system. The other thing is also, it doesn't necessarily have to be to right click to go to their properties. It could be to right click and delete too, right? Yeah. So. That's the thing is even if they're suspicious and they don't even want to know anything about it, they're like, yep, nope, that's not my problem. I want nothing to do with that. If you if they're just trying to go to delete it, all it takes again is a right click and you'll see they grab the hashes again. So I would come down here to hit delete, but it's already too late. This just blew my mind. So I, 
I literally I I went over his piece his POC and his article that he wrote on it and I did a super deep dive into it and I studied it I want to say for a total of like 10 hours two days in a row so like a total of 20 hours of just doing a super deep dive into this technique I, I was doing a little research on it and I actually found a way to make it even more powerful so um, we're gonna go ahead and clear this out what we're gonna do is we're gonna start responder again so we got responder running again and what I found out is that so you you have both the URL that it points to and then the URL for the icon like the target URL for what it's supposed to open and the the URL for where the icon is located. So essentially what I did is I had the target URL point to the icon so that the file self references itself. And what this does is like, watch, I'll switch to desktop. And when we go back to downloads, you'll notice that it grabs the hashes without any user interaction at all. So it was already insane just as a one click exploit. Again, if you make the target so we'll click on it, it's gonna do that, but let's go ahead and look at properties. Boom, right here. The target URL, uh, this is where it would typically pop up. You see right here, it's pointing to the SMB share, but if we go to the change icon right here, this is where I've made it self-reference itself. So it's a fake EXE and then index of zero, which means look at this file, look at this file itself. So this, this uh, link right here is self-referencing itself which makes it so it's an actual zero click exploit and you don't have to do anything. It's just because whenever you go to this directory, the explorer itself is querying the file to try and load the icon. And again, the icon is pointing to the, the target URL is point or the icon location is pointing to the target URL so it causes it to run without any user interaction so simply getting this to download on their system it's over as soon as they travel to that directory the hashes are sent over to my listener so you just have to be really good at phishing someone right like download this file so if you download it and you go oh my god this was an accident I don't want this file I made a mistake you're going to delete it it's already too late yeah uh 100 so the one thing though is this particular version using the shortcut this one can't be delivered in an email so what happens when you download a file from the internet is windows gives it a zone identifier which kind of tells you where the file came from and it assigns certain permissions to it. When you download something from the internet, you get a zone identifier of three, which says, hey, I'm from the internet, so maybe don't do everything that you normally do with files to me, which in this case means it won't try to load the icon URI URL, so it won't actually work. Now there are workarounds to this. You can use a, uh, like a .url file. That doesn't have a zone identifier when you, when you download it. So that is an alternative. Or another uh, workaround that I found, something that I use very often, is the PowerShell modules. So if you put this shortcut inside of a PowerShell module and somebody installs that PowerShell module from the gallery, it doesn't give it a zone identifier. So basically, as soon as they download that, if they're ever in that directory looking at the readme or anything else, then it also will fire off without anything to stop it. So if I want to experiment with this exploit, where do I go? How do I get started? I actually made it really incredibly easy. The original exploit was written in C and it needed to be compiled to an executable and then you had to use that executable to make that link file, the POC link file, and then go from there. I took it a step further and I decided to make it incredibly easy. So what you can do is you can go to my website powershellforhackers.com come over here to payloads we're going to scroll down to the bottom and i got a payload called create smb hash leak link and just a few details and we have both the full it's just a powershell function so you copy this run it in your powershell window here's the whole function and then here's the syntax once you have that function loaded in this is all it takes uh, you pass in whatever link file it is uh, whatever you want it to call, where you want it to go, your SMB share path, and then just a little description uh, that'll show up whenever you're highlighting it. And this will generate that link file for you without any other dependencies, complete low bin style. And for people that are watching this, make sure you go follow Jacoby on Twitter. He has a brand new YouTube channel, so make sure you go check it out. And if you haven't already, do me a favor, hit that like, subscribe, and drop a comment, and I'll see you all in the next video.